So our speaker, uh, Brian Reinhardt, he is the founder of CivilWarRecords.com. Uh, he is a graduate of Boston University Certificate of Genealogy Research and the Genealogical Institute of Federal Records, which is GenFed for anyone who would like to know. So that's in DC. Uh, he's a direct descendant of six Civil War soldiers. He specializes in research and record retrieval for the Civil War and 1812, which is why we're all here this evening. Uh, and he does his research primarily at the National Archives in DC and has retrieved military files for hundreds of clients. So he's a really awesome researcher and a really excellent speaker. So I'm really excited for Brian's program this evening. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me here tonight. Um, I spoke here last month, so I'm glad to be invited back. And I'm seeing all your uh, little introductions pop up in the chat there. It looks like just about every state is represented here. So that's kind of cool. Glad you guys could all join tonight. All right. so. As the title here says, we're going to be looking at records from the War of 1812 tonight. I've spent a lot of time at the National Archives over the past several years, working a lot with Civil War Records, which is the name of my website, and also War of 1812 Records. And in the course of doing that, I learned a lot about these 1812 records. They can be a little bit confusing if you don't know your way around and you don't know how to navigate them. But I'm going to try to break it down and make it um, simple as possible. So you can understand what kind of records might be available for your War of 1812 ancestor. A lot of people, by the end of this presentation, they're, they're very surprised how much is actually available for their soldiers at the archives. That being said, let me tell you a little bit about what this talk is not going to be about. This talk is not really a historical overview of the war. We're not going to be talking about the different battles that went on and the military strategy, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to be focusing more on the genealogical aspect of it and the records that were left behind that can help you win your family history research. So that being said, I'm going to break my own rule really quick, though, and just give you a very quick historical overview, just one screen worth, just so you can put some of this into context and make sense of what you're looking at. So the first thing I want to tell you, the war lasted almost three years from June of 1812 to February of 1815. Now that February 1815 becomes an important date later on in this presentation, maybe like a half hour from now, you will hear that date again and you'll understand why that's significant. That's the end of the war, but that becomes uh, significant when you look at some of these other records. The war was between the US and Britain. The war actually ended in a draw they um, both sides kind of came together and realized that uh, they could settle this and they were both kind of content with the agreement they came up with. So they ended the war and it was kind of a draw. They both went their own ways. There were about a half a million Americans involved in this war. The vast majority of them were local militiamen that were called up from the individual states. And there were Native Americans involved in this war and there were also African Americans that were involved in this war. A lot of them ended up siding with the British. As you can imagine, some of them, a lot of them, weren't really happy with what was going on in America at the time. So they were more than willing to join up against with the British against America. But there were still a lot of them that fought for uh, the American side. Now, this number here varies. I've seen different reports. I've seen some that say like two to 3,000. I uh, have seen reports that say 15,000 Americans were killed. It kind of varies in there. Um, I don't know the exact number, but I'm going with a 15,000 number that about 15,000 Americans were killed. And uh, unfortunately for genealogists like us today, there was uh, another tragedy that happened where the British came through in 1814, burned a lot of the capital, including a lot of records that were related, were related to the military in 1814. So fortunately, a lot of the records that we're going to be talking about tonight still exist because they were created after 1814. But you're going to find, just in general, there's definitely a shortage of military records before 1814. So the title of this talk, like I said, was Navigating the Records from the War of 1812. So sticking with that navigation theme, this is the roadmap that we're going to be following. 
this is kind of like an outline of the talk that we'll be doing, uh, I'll be doing tonight. So if you're the kind that likes to know where we're going step by step, this is your screen right here. We're going to start with the service records. We're going to jump ahead to the 1850s and talk about bounty land applications and bounty land warrants. Then we're going to jump ahead all the way into the 1870s when most pensions became available. So that's the roadmap we're going to be following. So let's go ahead and start and look at the compiled military service records. That's kind of a mouthful. Um, they can be abbreviated a lot of times CMSR. And I actually a lot of times just call them service records. So if you hear me talk about service records, this is what I'm referring to. Every time we talk about a new record group, I will give you some tips as far as navigating the you know, tips to use them better. And I will also give you some tips on where you can find these records. So the tips for navigating these service records. These are good records to have. They give you basic information to start with when you start doing your research on your ancestor. Basic information like how long they served, uh, what was the captain's name, what regiment was he in, what was his rank. Now, while that might be interesting information to look into and learn about, it actually becomes useful when you're help, when you're trying to identify your ancestor in some of these later records, and you find out there is more than one John Johnson from Ohio that was in the War of 1812, you can kind of run, um, narrow this down by, well, I know that mine was a sergeant, so I need to look for records of John Johnson, the sergeant, or I know that he was in Captain Williams' company, so I need to look for records of John Johnson and Captain Williams' company. Those kind of things that could be useful later on. Because these are compiled military service records, as the name suggests, it's compiled from all different various records at the National Archives, such as the muster rolls, hospital records, prisoner of war records, all those kind of things. The uh, pension clerks went through all of these records, and every time they found a soldier's name in one of these records, they would write up a little card about it, put it in the service record packet that we can look at today. These actually can help you unlock other records to look for as well. If you see a mention that your ancestor got in trouble and got court-martialed, you know to look for those records. If he was captured and it's mentioned in there that he was taken prisoner, you can then go look for prisoner of war records. And if you're lucky, these sometimes will contain some other miscellaneous documents that relate to his service. And I'll show you an example of that here in a second. Now, one thing to keep in mind, there is a difference between the regular army and the state militias in this war. The regular army, these are the men that were already in the military when the war started. Let's say that someone went out today and joined the army. We're not in wartime right now. And so they would just be joining the regular army. If the war broke out, they would use those guys to fight the war. That's what happened with the War of 1812. These men that were already in the army were called up. So they are in a U.S. regiment, as opposed to the state militias that were called up because the war was going on. That's when you find like the Indiana infantry or you know, Ohio infantry, those kind of things. So I'm saying all that because with the regular army, the U.S. infantries, they will not have these service records. Only the state militia do. But the good news is, 90 to 95 percent of the soldiers in this war were in the state militias. So most of the soldiers, like I said, 90, 95 percent of them will have these service records. So if you're familiar with the website fold3.com, they have a lot of military records on that site. If you go on there, they've got a lot of indexes for these records. So if you go on that site and you type in, I'm using a soldier named Henry Stoner as an example. If you go to Fold3 and you type in the service record index that you're looking for Henry Stoner, this is what you find. This is an image that came directly from Fold3. The problem is, this is the only thing that you will find because this is only an index card. This is not the record itself. This is telling you that there will be a service record packet for him at the National Archives. So when I was at the National Archives, I requested the service record packet that was associated with this index. 
and this is what they brought me. It's an envelope with obviously his name on it. You get the name of his regiment, the captain um, right here. It says private, private. This means that he started his service as a private. He ended his service as a private. If these differ, you know that he was either promoted or demoted at one point during the war. These numbers here are serial numbers for the individual cards in there. They're not going to contribute a whole lot to your research. The one thing you can draw from this, though, is that because there are four numbers here, there's going to be four of those long rectangular cards inside. And in this case, those miscellaneous personal papers, there is one inside of there that we can look at. So these is, this is an example of some of the cards that you will find in there. You get information that tells you um, when he uh, when he had enlisted, when his term of service expired, where he was living at the time, place of rendezvous where he started his service, how far he traveled, where he was discharged, all those kind of things. Now you may be looking at this and thinking, you know, that's I mean that's cool I guess to know that he traveled 41 miles in the war, but why do I really care? Well, the thing is, this is documented for a reason. And when we start talking about bounty land, you'll see that the distance that you traveled could make a difference in how much bounty land you got later on. So that's why that's marked, that's included in there. For those miscellaneous personal papers, this is another envelope that was inside that first envelope. And it's mentioning in here, that that miscellaneous paper is related to payment or clothing. And this is the actual document that was in there. This was an actual document from 1814 saying that Henry Stoner was owed $17.25. So this is the actual document that was in there. That's kind of kind of cool to find a document that old about one of your ancestors. So where do you find these compiled military service records? You're going to notice a theme throughout this whole presentation that every time I mention, or every time I ask this question, this first line is not going to change. The originals for all of these will be at the National Archives. However, a lot of them are indexed online. Some of them, the actual records have been digitized online. So in this case, the service records, they are all indexed on Fold 3. That's what I just showed you for Henry Stoner, that black and white image. If your ancestor was in a Native American regiment, or if he was from Mississippi, those are all on Fold 3 already. And I think they might be working on putting more on there, but so far, last time I checked, that's all that's there. So that was the service records. That was our first stop on this roadmap. And I did that a little quickly because I want to spend more time talking about bounty land and pensions. That's where you get a lot of the good stuff for these records. So I want to save our time for those. So with bounty land, there are two different types of records that we're going to look at. There are the bounty land applications, and then there were the bounty land warrants that were issued as the result of an approved application. And we're going to spend some time looking at both of these. Now, before we actually look at the documents, I want to put these sort of into context so you understand why your ancestor may have applied for bounty land in 1850, but not 1812 or why maybe your ancestor's application was denied. Those kind of things help you understand these records better instead of just blindly looking at a document and saying, that's cool, but I don't really know what I'm looking at. I'm gonna help you understand what you're looking at here. So you can see here, there are three main bounty land acts that relate to the War of 1812. Um, for the sake of convenience, I'm just calling this one the War of 1812 era because uh, there were there was a bounty land act passed in 1811 uh, another one in 1812 it got amended in 1816 i'm not going to bore you with all those details so i will just call this the 1812 era these bounty land acts were passed to encourage enlistment they started looking around and realizing you know what we look like we are headed for war and we don't have nearly enough men in our military to fight this war so we need to get some more men on board to fight with us. So they put the word out that if you sign up in the regular army, not one of the state militias, but if you sign up for the regular army, we will give you bounty land. But you had to meet certain requirements first. 
first of all, you had to be between the ages of 18 and 45. When I said it got amended in 1816, that age limit got amended and taken away. So even if you were 50 years old and signed up, you now were eligible. You had to have signed on for five years, even if you didn't serve the full five years because the war ended and you uh, they didn't need you anymore and just discharged you. As long as you were on record saying that you would have served that five years, that counted. You had to have left on good terms. You, if you got in trouble or you know dishonorably discharged or if you just deserted, they weren't going to give you your bounty land. This one here was a controversial one. It was only good for the uh, soldiers and also the non-commissioned officers. Now, the non-commissioned officers, as opposed to a commissioned officer, the commissioned officers, those were the guys that were like in uh, West Point, the career military guys that decided my career is going to be a military officer. They had formal training and they went out and that was their career. Well, because this was to encourage new enlistees, these commissioned officers were already on board. That was already their plan to be there. So they didn't get um, they didn't get this bounty land. They were upset about it. The government held their ground, quite literally held their ground and said, no, um, you were already signed up, so you don't count for the bounty land. So they weren't they weren't all that happy, but that's the way it was. The original Bounty Land Act said that they were entitled to get 160 acres at first. As the war continued to drag on and they needed more men, two years later, they doubled it and said, you know, we really need men to serve. We'll give you 320 acres of free land if you serve. So in this case, um, for this Bounty Land Act, if you were the heir of someone who was killed in action, you could apply for that bounty land on their behalf. That was not the case for all of these bounty land acts, but this one, um, the heirs, the wife or the children or the parents or sibling, whoever your next of kin was, they could apply. So let's move forward to 1850. That's when most bounty land was given out. By that point, it changed from an enticement to enlist. Now it was just a reward for the service. All those, all those officers now were eligible. Those commissioned officers finally got their bounty land. War of 1812 bounty land is always, uh, almost always given in 40 acre increments. So if you see someone getting bounty land and it's 100 acres, that is probably not War of 1812 bounty land. That's probably revolutionary war land. That's one way you could tell those two apart. War of 1812 land is almost always in 40 acre increments. There's a couple exceptions, but for the most part, you're gonna find 40, 80, 120, 160, or 320 acres when it comes to bounty land. Depending on how long you served, you were eligible for more bounty land. The minimum, you had to serve for one month minimum, and then you would get your 40 acres of bounty land. In 1852, they made a small change, and I mentioned in those service records about the distance they traveled. This is where that came in. Every 20 miles that was traveled, you would count as one day extra service. So in the case of Henry Stoner, he traveled 41 miles, so he could tack on two extra days to however long he served. If he had served maybe only 29 days and he was you know, one or two days short, those two extra days could make a difference. In this case, the widows and the minor children could still apply, but not the adult children. And so 1855, another Bounty Land Act was passed five years later. I compare this one to, um, of all things, trick-or-treating candy. You know, we just had Halloween a couple of weeks ago. And I'm sure that some of you gave out candy for uh, trick-or-treating, right? So at the beginning of the night, let's say you have four bags of candy that you've given out. First couple of kids come to the door, you're given two or three pieces each because you don't want to run out of candy. But let's say trick-or-treating ends at 8 o'clock and at 7.30, 7.45, and you still have two bags of candy. Well, you're probably going to be a lot more generous with that candy because you realize you've got a lot to give away. And so, you know, why not? So that I compare that because bouncing back to 1850, 
at the minimum, if you served one month, you would get 40 days. In 1855, they, served, they changed it to where as long as you served 14 days, you could get 160 acres. So they really became a lot less restrictive on that and a lot more generous. Same thing, if you left on bad terms, you were not eligible. Now, here's the thing too, using that trick-or-treating analogy, if kids came to your door at the beginning of trick-or-treating and got two pieces of candy, and then their buddy tells them, you know what, that lady down the street gave me eight pieces of candy, guess where you're going to go next? You're heading back to the house to get the rest of your candy, aren't you? Because you realize they're being a lot more generous now. That's the same thing with these soldiers. If they only got 40 acres before, they could now come back and get 120 acres more and get bumped up to 160 acres total. So you see a lot of soldiers doing that. They're getting two different plots of bounty land. So now that you maybe understand how those bounty land acts worked, let's look at the bounty land applications that these soldiers had to fill out. So some tips for navigating these applications. First of all, you need to understand that the land was not just given out. If you were a soldier, you would have to apply for that first. Using that trick-or-treating analogy, you probably are not walking down the street just finding, looking for kids to give that candy to. Because that would be kind of weird. But that's just not how it worked. They have to knock on your door and, you know, do the trick-or-treating thing and pretty much ask for the candy. Same thing here. They had to apply for this land, and that's what this record group was about, the applications that were filled out. Now, I know that when we talk about military records, a lot of people are tempted to say, I want to find my ancestors' military pension file. And I don't blame you because those pensions can have really good information. But in the case of the War of 1812, bounty land came first. Bounty land came up in 1850, pensions not till 1871. So more soldiers are going to be getting bounty land than ever got pensions. So if you're not finding them in the pension, pension files, Check the bounty line applications because a lot of that same kind of information will be in these applications. One little tip to, to remember, a lot of times these records were on blue paper. Um, not always, but if you're looking through a bunch of 1812 documents and you find something on blue paper, most likely that's going to be a bounty line application. Now, the one reason why these bounty line applications can become so valuable, especially in the case where it's a widow, applying on behalf of the soldier is because the widow would have to document and prove the marriage in order to be eligible. So you find some really good genealogical information from this time period in these applications. Um, one thing to keep in mind too, if the soldier and the widow both died by 1850, their ancestor's journey on that roadmap most likely won't go any further than the service records. There are some exceptions, and I'm going to show you some of the pensions that some of these men may have been eligible for. But for the most part, um, you're not going to find, if, if they're both gone by 1850 and there weren't any young children left behind, most likely this isn't going to apply to your ancestor. So we're going to look at these bounty line applications. I showed you that there were different ones in 1812 era. There was a different type of application that was uh, uh, submitted. This is actually something that I found just today, a couple hours ago at the National Archives. So you're looking at fresh new content here, hot off the presses. This was a soldier named Moses Jensen, who was applying for bounty land under the Act of 1812. And he pretty much just had to document that he was involved in the war. So he submitted his original discharge certificate as part of his bounty line application. So that's um, a pretty interesting find there, something from, from the year, most of these were done in 1815, I don't see, yeah, May of 1815. He was discharged from the, the military and he submitted that to document that he was in the war. So one thing to note too, because of the 1812 bounty line, bounty line act, because the heirs of the people who were killed in action were eligible, you can find some interesting information in these files too. This is another one that I found just today. A soldier by the name of, was it Thomas Cohort? And if you read through here, you see that he actually died in the war. 
said he was taken sick and removed to Philadelphia and died the first day of April, 1813. And they inserted here unmarried and without issue, meaning he didn't have children. So he didn't have a wife or kids that were his legal heir. So in this case, Catherine Robert Robbins, who was formerly Catherine Cohart, aged 32 years, and John Cohart, 27 years, are the brother and sister of the said Thomas Cohart and the only legitimate heirs in law. So um, if your ancestor died in the war, you actually may get some good genealogical information from these records. Let's look at these, though. The bounty line applications from the Acts of 1850 and 1855, that's where most of your ancestors are going to fall, are in these acts here. We're going to be looking at the uh, bounty line application for a soldier by the name of Nicholas Fox. Actually, his widow, Margaret, was the one that was filing. We're going to use this one as an example for a couple different things moving forward. This, you can see the blue tint on the paper because it's a bounty line application. I know it's hard to read all that. If we had time, I'd go through all this because there's some really good information on here. But I want to highlight one particular paragraph that was in this application. It's actually um, one big long run on sentence, but we'll just call it a paragraph. So in this one paragraph, when you read through here, I've looked through here and I found, I found at least 12 pieces of genealogically significant evidence in this paragraph, this one paragraph alone. These include um, the name of her husband, Margaret's maiden name, which was Merkham. And the man that was giving this affidavit, Conrad Merkham, was testifying that they really were married. He was giving proof, um, his testimony that proved that Margaret Merkham and uh, Nicholas Fox really were married. And it's a pretty good clue that Margaret Merkham and Conrad Merkham have the same last name. Um, we can't say 100%, but we can assume that they were related somehow. We have the date of the marriage. We have when Nicholas died. We have the name of the clergyman that married them, which if you can research that clergyman's name, you may be able to figure out what kind of denomination he belonged to, which could unlock church records for this family. We have the fact that Margaret didn't remarry and she moved to Ohio after the war, after he died, I'm sorry. So a lot of good genealogical information in this bounty line application, a marriage that happened in 1804. A lot of these vital records just weren't kept or even survived from that time period. So this may be the only place you may find some of these in, this information. This is another bounty line application that I found Benjamin Brookins was married to Esther Olds, and they are documenting the exact date of birth for both of them and the exact uh, date of the marriage, all of it happening in the 1700s. So where do you find these bounty line applications? Hopefully you can guess the first line would be that uh, the originals are all the National Archives, right? That's going to be correct. But the location of these is a little bit uh, complicated to narrow down where they're at. I made a little flow chart, and this flow chart is in the handout. So if, um, if you forget this, you can refer to the handout. But the, the, the location of these applications are going to be dependent on whether or not there was a pension filed later in life. If there was a pension filed in the 1870s, the bounty line applications were supposed to have been consolidated and put inside of that pension file. For the most part, that happened. There probably are exceptions where it didn't happen. But for the most part, the bounty line application will be in the pension file if there was a pension. So that may raise the question, where are the pension files? So full three is digitizing all of these War of 1812 pensions that were granted and putting them on their site. Now, full three is a paid subscription site, but they worked out a deal that even if you don't pay to access Fold 3, you can get these War of 1812 pensions free of charge, even if you don't pay to get on Fold 3. They are still in the middle of digitizing them. I got put on hold because of COVID, but I understand that they are uh, picking that up again and they, they're working on it. It's a slow process, but they're working on it. Um, I need to update this. 
I understand now that it's A through part of R and part of S. They didn't finish the R's and they didn't finish the S's yet. But for the most part, the beginning, you know, two thirds of the alphabet is already on fold three. The end of the alphabet, the originals are at the National Archives and that's the only place you can get them for now. At some point they will be on fold three, they're just not there yet. So, okay, if there was no pension filed, these bounty line applications were put into a separate record group there at the archives. You're not gonna find these online. You, these are only really gonna be available at the National Archives. There's an index for them that they were working on before COVID and the indexing kind of got stopped because of COVID. And I was just talk, talking to the lady who was working on, one of the ladies working on the indexing uh, just the other day. And she said they have not resumed their indexing yet. So they got A through L indexed onto fold three, but you know, M through the end, they're not indexed on there yet, but hopefully they pick that up at some point because that's a useful index. If you find your ancestor in that bounty line application index, this is the kind of entry that you would see. This is right from fold three. This is Nicholas Box, where we were looking at Margaret Box's application a couple of minutes ago. This is the index entry for that bounty land application that we just looked at. Has information on here, like uh, what year, what uh, war he was in, where he was from, the name of the captain and all that. At the beginning, when we talked about the service records, how the name of the captain and all that can be useful, you can match some of that up between the service records and this here to know if that really is your ancestor. This line right here, if you see that, it's a confusing line. And I don't blame you for being confused because it's worded a little bit strange um, because it's saying, was the bounty land ap application rejected? And it says false. Um, if you look at that as a true or false statement, this application was rejected false, meaning it was approved. So in this case, if you see false, it's a good thing. It means it was approved. But I will also tell you that in one sense, whether it was rejected or not, it almost doesn't really matter at this point. Because let's say that you went out and you applied for a job and you had an interview, fill out the application, you had the interview and you didn't get hired. Well, that application was still on file somewhere, right? Same with these. The application was still filled out. It's just that they were denied. So the application should still be there. It just means there will be no bounty land to look up after this step, but the application should still be there. The warrant number. When I first started doing these, I did not realize there was a method to how they numbered these. It just kind of looked like a random string of numbers. But if you remember these bounty land acts, 1812, 1850, 1855, well, this bounty land was granted under the act of 1855. If you remember bounty land was always given in 40 acre increments. So under the act of 1855, Margaret Box was granted 120 acres of bounty land and the document number here, 42351. So remember that number 42351 because you're gonna see that show up here in about 60 to 90 seconds. You'll see that again, 42351. So well, that was the service records and then the bounty land applications in the 1850s. Let's look at the bounty land warrants that were granted as a result of the approved, ap approved applications. So the process was you would submit the application for the bounty land. If you were approved, you would get this very nice looking certificate in return. So that warrant that we just saw, 55, 120, 42351. This certificate for the warrant, it's hard to read there, but it says under the act of March 3rd, 1855, you can see 120 acres and there's 42351. So because that application was filled out, they were given this bounty land warrant for 120 acres. So some tips for navigating these warrants now. So basically these worked as uh, vouchers for the land. It's kind of like if I gave you a $50 gift card to Walmart and you went out and you, well, maybe I'd say $500 gift card to Walmart and you went out and you bought a TV with it. Well, 
it wouldn't really be fair to say that I gave you a TV. I gave you the gift card and then you went and redeemed the gift card for that TV. So that's how these warrants worked. It's kind of like a gift card and they could go redeem the land in federal land estates. So this process here, you're gonna see this over and over again throughout the next couple of minutes here, because this is very important. If you don't understand this process, a lot of this won't make sense moving forward. So we talked about the application. If you were approved, you got the warrant. Once you redeemed the warrant, which is like using the gift card to buy the TV, once you redeemed the warrant, you got the land and you were given the patent for the land. A word you might be more, be more familiar with is like a deed for a land, but for federal land, they call them patents. So they're basically the same concept, the patent or like the deed for the land. Once they redeemed their, their, their warrant, they were given the patent for the land then. A lot of this bounty land, um, not all of it, but the majority of it was in this area of the country, Iowa, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, Missouri, and early on, uh, Arkansas. But I'm going to read some of your minds right now because you saw that and your heart probably sunk a little bit because you were like, I, well, you were all excited about getting this bounty land information for your ancestor. And then you saw this and you're like, wait, my ancestor was from Massachusetts. And I know he was always in Massachusetts and he never moved out to Wisconsin or anything. So clearly he didn't get bounty land. Well, that's not really the case. I mean, that could be true, but don't rule it out because um, most of the time, these soldiers or the widows never even stepped foot on the bounty land. It was sold off right away before they even went there. The reason for that, remember, this was the 1850s. The war had take, taken place 35 years earlier. So let's say there was a 21, a 20 year old guy that was in the war of 1812. 35 years later, he's 55 years old. And that's on the young end. If you were 35 years old during the war, you're going to be, what, 70 years old at this point? Or 60 years old at this point? I forget what number I just said. But you're going to be later in life. I'll say that. You're going to be older at that point. And a lot of these soldiers were in that situation where they didn't want to pack up and move away from their family and friends and community and go to some of this relatively unsettled land at that stage of their life. So some soldiers did do that, former soldiers, but for the most part, they didn't do that. It's like I said, if I give you the gift card, if you want to give that gift card to somebody else, you're free to do that. And they, they can then go get the TV with that. Same thing. They sold a lot of these warrants off right away. So you can now get excited again that your ancestor may actually be in these records. The person that uh, was assigned the, the warrants or the purchased the warrant, in a lot of cases, it wasn't really family members. It could be family, so it's worth looking into, but in a lot of cases, it wasn't. These warrants, you know, for the most part, they're not really going to have a whole lot of genealogical evidence. They're kind of cool to look at, and my approach is if there's a document at the National Archives with my ancestor's name on it, I want that document. I want to have it. So it's still worth looking at. But you know what? There are cases where there is genealogical evidence, and I will show you one. So don't rule it out. If you really are stuck looking for family information, these warrants could be the answer. I already mentioned this, but by 1855, they were entitled to get a full 160 acres of that Halloween candy analogy. So keep going back, looking for that second warrant. One question I get a lot is if they got 40 acres on the first one and went back and got 120 acres, was that like side-by-side -side land? Um, I guess it's possible that if you went and got 40 acres and you claimed it, let's say you claimed it in Iowa, and five years later you were eligible for more and you went back and got that and there was open land next to where you were, you could claim it for that, but it was not a guaranteed thing. And the fact that so many of these soldiers didn't even go out to that land themselves, that kind of got sold off. The only Maybe the one person got the first plot of bounty land and a totally different person got the second plot of bounty land and they claimed it in you know Michigan 
So it's not very likely it's going to be side by side. I suppose it's possible, but it's far from being a guaranteed thing. Oh, I was showing you that because they're entitled to 160 acres, keep looking for that second warrant. You should recognize this one. This is the one we just saw for 120 acres. But I thought she should have another one for 40 acres, making 160 acres total. Sure enough, here's the other one for 40 acres. This one actually came first under the Act of 1850. And then she went back and got the rest of her Halloween candy, the rest of her acreage. 120 acres again. This is the back of those warrants. A lot of legal talk. Uh, Margaret Box is assigning this warrant to Solomon Sturgis, so she sold the right to claim the land to him. If you look on here, this handwriting is pretty much all the same until you get to Solomon Sturgis and Zanesville, Ohio. I have a feeling she wrote this out or had it written out, kind of like a blank check waiting to sell this to somebody. And once she realized that someone named Solomon Sturgis was willing to buy that, they filled the name out and where he was from on there. If you're the type that likes to collect your ancestor's signature, this would be a good document for you to get. In this case, she left her mark, but if your ancestor could write, their, their signature would be on there. Now I had mentioned that these don't always have good uh, genealogical evidence. This is one of the exceptions, though. There was a lady named Hebsabeth Marshall. She was claiming bounty land on the behalf of her husband, John Marshall, who had died. And in the bounty land warrant was an extra document, this one right here. It's mentioning that she died in 1859 without a will. So in this case, um, she had applied for the land. She had gotten the warrant but she had never redeemed the warrant by that point. So she died at this point right here. So in this case, her sons were eligible to inherit that warrant because it was already granted. So in this case, kind of a little more unique situation, but not totally unheard of, that someone may have died in the middle of these two things right here. But in this case, it happened. So you get the names of her sons here. Hezekiah and Abner Marshall came forward and said that we are inheriting this, but that's not documented in there. So where do you find these bounty land warrants and the patents? Hopefully you can guess the first line here. The originals are all at the National Archives. Those warrants, the certificates, those are not online. You're gonna have to get those from the National Archives. If you're looking for the patents though, most of them, if not all, I can't say for sure it's 100%, but I think it's pretty close if not. They're going to be scanned onto the Bureau of Land Management website. And the warrants themselves are indexed on that website as well. So you can get the index for the warrants and the actual patent. You can see who redeemed it and got the patent on that website. If you're not familiar with this website, this might be a brand new thing for you. I will show you what that website is. and. Um, some ways to work around that website and find what you're looking for. So I don't know if you recognize this. This is the index page for the Bureau of Land Management. If you have never been here, you need to spend some time poking around on here because there could be some information about your ancestors on here that you didn't even know about. The URL is right there, and that's also in your handout. So don't worry if you missed that. One thing to keep in mind when you're navigating this website, you can put somebody's name in there and you're going to get a lot of entries showing up. That's because it's for all federal land transactions, not just family land. So the Homestead Act was federal land. So that's indexed in there. You can find people who just went to a land office and paid cash for the land and moved in. That's federal land transactions. So you find there's those on there too. So you're gonna find a lot of entries on here for a lot of different types of transactions. Not just Bounty Land, but Bounty Land is indexed on here for the War of 1812. A little bit tricky to use because you need to use exact spelling when you go on that site. Sites like Ancestry, they're kind of intuitive. You type like my last name, Reinhardt, which I spell R-H-I-N-E-H-A-R-T. 
Ancestry is going to look at that and say, you know what, here's a spelling. It's a little bit different. Maybe it's R-I-N-E without the H. Maybe you want to see that too. So they start branching out and giving you other spellings. The site is not like that. So you have to kind of guess what spellings your ancestor may have been using, which is kind of hard to do if you've got maybe more unusual of a name. You kind of have to be creative. So I'm going to show you how to find your ancestor on this index. One, uh, this is a really cool website. One little thing that I wish they would change, but if by default, if you don't change this, you're only going to be searching for federal land in Alabama. And that's because that's the first state alphabetically. So you need to go and do the drop down menu. And that's the first thing I always do is just go to any state because you want to look for bounty land that was given out in any state. So we're going to look for James Marshall. Do you remember Hepzibeth Marshall, the lady who died without a will? This is her husband. And I chose this one on purpose because it's a little more of a common name. And I want to show you some tips on how to narrow down maybe a more common named soldier in this index. If you just put James Marshall in here and then just hit search, this is what you're going to get something like this. You can see here a lot of entries for someone named James Marshall who was involved in a federal land transaction. I had to cut this page off at the, at the middle because I didn't even fit the whole thing. You can see those 16 pages. So if there's like 15 on here and there's 16 pages, what is that? 240 or so. Um, I don't know if that's the right math, but that's what I came up with in my head really quick. A lot of hundreds of entries for James Marshall in this uh, federal land index. So I'm gonna go, oh wait, you can narrow it down by where it says MW, military warrants. You can narrow it down to look just for military warrants, which is the bounty land. But look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven entries for military warrants on this page alone. And we have 16 pages. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, even narrowing it down to these military warrants, that's not a good way to search. Let's use some tips on how to narrow this down. First thing to keep in mind, do you see down here, this is the enlarged part right here. There's a box that says search patentees and search warranties. So remember this, when they applied, they were given the warrant. Whoever redeemed the warrant was given the patent. Just like that gift card analogy, you were given the gift card, whoever redeemed the gift card would get the actual item. So in this case, we don't really care so much who got the end result. We don't care who got the patent at this point. We only want to know, was there a soldier named James Marshall who got a warrant? So that for the sake of this search, we're going to unclick that box right there and only search for soldiers who got the warrants. So that would narrow it down a lot in, in itself. Down here where it says authority, that's the category of federal land that they got. If you look on here, the Bounty Land Acts are called Scrip Warrant Acts. This should look familiar. There's 1812, there's 1850, there's 1855. So we can narrow it down to the Bounty Land Acts and it will take out all the Homestead Act, all of these school lands, all the state grants, all this stuff will just be completely ruled out of your search. So we're gonna look for anyone named James Marshall who got a Bounty Land Warrant We'll look for the Bounty Land Act of 1855. We're going to narrow down the search a lot just by doing that. And that's what we come up with. Still, we, we don't just have one name to look at, but it's only one page, though. So in a case with a common named person, this may be the best that you get. But it's much better than looking through hundreds and hundreds of entries. Now you maybe only have 12 or 15. So if you're looking through these, you may have noticed something already that because his widow's name was Hepzibeth and she was involved in this transaction, we should be able to look for anyone named James Marshall who's also indexed with the widow's name, Hepzibeth. Do you see that on here? Right up there at the top, James Marshall with Hepzibeth and the boys, Abner and Hezekiah, who claimed the land because she died without a will. And there's one other name on here, George Brimhall. Now, we don't know who that is, but it turns out 
George Brimhall is the one who actually got the patent for the land. I don't know if he's related, but James Marshall died. Hepzibeth claimed it on his behalf. She died and went to Abner and Hezekiah, and they sold it to George Brimhall. All that's documented on here. If you've got a soldier and you're trying to figure out, was this my ancestor? By clicking on that entry, you can see here, for example, he was involved in the U.S. Navy. So if you knew that your James Marshall was in the Navy, this is a pretty good clue. This could be your guy. If you see it showing up on here, the Illinois infantry, and you know that your guy was from Illinois, that's a good clue. If you know that your wid the widow's name was, you know, in this case, Hepzibeth, you know that's a pretty good clue that this is your guy. Well, there are some ways on here to narrow down some of those common name soldiers. So on here, this index is showing that he got 160.69 acres. That's a good example of, it's not always exactly 40 acre increments. In this case, it went a little bit over, but it's close enough that it's clear that that still follows that 40 acre increment rule. And document number 91575. So if you go to the National Archives and request the warrant that's being referenced in this entry, this is what they will bring you. Um, it went too far. Um, under the Act of 1855, got 160 acres, document number 91575. So that's how you can find your ancestor in that Bounty Land Warrant Index. One other thing you can do on here, there's a lot you can do, but one more thing that you can do when it relates to this land for your soldier in particular, is look to see who got the patent. In this case, the patent's been scanned on there. All that's detailed on there. Hepzibeth Marshall, widow of James Marshall. He was in the Navy. And it says on here, it was assigned to Hezekiah and Abner Marshall, heirs of Hepzibeth Marshall. And it was given to George Brimhall. So all that's documented on the patent itself. This isn't just a copy of the original patent, actually. The original patent would have gone to the settler of the land. This went on record at the National Archives, well, and the, the General Land Office, which eventually went to the National Archives. I want to point out one thing that may break your heart, because I've heard this from people. They get all excited, and they tell me that they have a document with their ancestor's name on it that was signed by the President of the United States. And I could see why you would think that, because it certainly looks like there's Abraham Lincoln's name right there, right? I enlarged it there. It certainly looks like that could have been, you know, done by Abraham Lincoln. But let's use a little bit of common sense here. This was in June of 1861. Their whole thing got tied up a little bit because of the, the widow dying and the boys coming forward. So this didn't get redeemed until 1861 in June. Civil War just started a couple months before that. I think Abraham Lincoln had better things to do than sit in his office and sign these federal land grants for people all day. And the people that, that passed these laws knew that. So the president's way too busy to sign all these. Originally, they had to sign off on these way back when it first started, like, you know, way back in the early presidents. But they changed it and said that the secretary could sign on his behalf. So the original copy of this probably was signed by a guy named uh, W.O. Stoddard and not Abraham Lincoln. So I'm sorry to break your heart, but you probably don't have a document signed by the president. So those were the service records and then the bounty land. Let's go over and look at the pensions that were granted in the 1870s. Same with the Bounty Land, there were three main pension acts that covered pensioners. The 1812 era, again, there were several of those in that category that I'll show you. But for the most part, most pensions were not granted until the 1870s. We have 1871 and 1878. So to help you understand these ones better, if you were a soldier who died in the war, or if you were seriously disabled, not just a slight you know, you walk with a limp now. No, it has to be like you're really disabled and you really can't support yourself anymore. You could be eligible for a War of 1812 pension. A lot of those were called the old war pensions. 
It's a whole category of pensions that are indexed on family search. So if you don't see your ancestor in any of those pension indexes, not just for 1812, but like Mexican War, Indian Wars, check out that old war pension index on family search. You may find them in there. There was another category of pensions called the half pay pensions. That if you died in the war, your widow and children, they were eligible to get half of your military pay for the next five years. So there's a whole category of those pensions. But for the most part, like I said, most of the soldiers um, didn't get pensions till the 1870s. So same with bounty land, the first bounty land, the first pension act in 1871 was uh, a little more restrictive and they really eased up in 1878. So in 1871, you had to have served at least 60 days. You had to have left on good terms. Do you remember at the beginning of this presentation, I told you to remember that date of February 1815 becomes a, because it becomes important. This is when it becomes important is right here. That in order for a widow to be eligible for a pension, they had to have been married before February 17th, 1815, when the treaty was, space treaty was signed. They did not want uh, people coming around like young women or even middle-aged women marrying these older soldiers just to get their pensions. So they wanted to say, they, they wanted to honor the fact that you were married to an actual soldier during the war. So in that case, you can be eligible for the pension. This one right here, if you had aided the Confederacy, you were disqualified. And that may be a little confusing to you. That's not a mistake. The Confederacy was a Civil War era thing. And I really am mentioning a Civil War thing in the middle of an 1812 talk. But look at the date this was granted, 1871. It was six years after the Civil War ended. So it was still fresh on their, their mind. And they said, you know, even if you did a good job during the War of 1812, if during the most recent war, if you were part of the Confederacy, if you aided them, if you were supporting them, if you gave money to the cause, um, we're not going to give you a War of 1812 pension. So kind of an interesting uh, tie-in to two different eras in time, how they affected each other. So seven years later, they changed it up a lot. They got rid of that Confederacy thing and they said, we don't, it's fine. We'll, we'll give you a pension either way. And instead of serving for 60 days, they said, okay, if you serve for 14 days, as long as you serve 14 days, we will give you a pension. And even if you were married a week before the soldier died in 1878, that's fine. You qualify. They really eased up a couple of years later. So remember when I mentioned these old war pensions, if you are looking on fold three in the pension indexes, you may see uh, two different types of entries. This one right here is part of, see where it says old war widow. This is part of the old war pensions that are, that are on file. These would be soldiers that were maybe disabled during the war. See where it says death or disability. These are guys that were uh, died or disabled during the war. But for the most part, what you're going to find are these kind of pension index cards from the 1870s. Now, I had mentioned those half pay pensions. And these are a hidden gem at the National Archives. Um, I was just looking at some of these uh, today, a couple hours ago, at the National Archives. So I mentioned that in the 1812 era for the pensions that if you were killed during the war, you could get the half pay. In 1816, they uh, passed that law. So if you were one that died in the war, your widow and children could be eligible to get that half year pay for five years. I just took this picture earlier today. I requested one of those boxes. These are not all half pay documents. These are what are called the paymaster records where the paymaster was documenting money coming in and out, payment to individual soldiers. But these half pay pension files are included in there. They're very old, very brittle, and there's a ton of them. This is just one box out of like, well, there's a lot of them. They're not indexed, they're not online. They're very tedious to go through and find. But if you ever have time um, to go through there, you, you know, you could get a good payoff because there's good information in these. This right here, explains the law that was passed. This is actually from one of those half pay pensions. 
They needed to document the legality of the marriage, the name of the widow. If there were young children left behind that were under 16, they needed that. And they needed people to sign off on the legality of the marriage, basically, is what is that, that, what that's saying. So this was one of those half-pay pensions that I kind of just picked at random. Someone was testifying that they knew that the two of them were married, the soldier and his wife. They saw John Mosley, who was the son of Nathan Mosley. John Mosley was the soldier. Nathan Mosley would have been his father. And Delilah Mosley, formerly Wall, so that's Delilah's maiden name was Wall, joined together in holy matrimony by John Moore, a Methodist preacher in 1816. So what, yeah, that's quite a fine, quite, gene, quite good genealogical evidence from that time period. And then she went on to document the names of all the children that were there, names and birth dates. Uh, Joseph, born 27th of December, 1806. Ginny, February 14th, 1809. Sarah, January 24th, 1811. And she's listed a couple more of the children there. But that's some pretty good information from that time period. So if you have a soldier who died in the War of 1812, you need to look in to see if he got a half pay, the family got a half pay pension. I showed you this a little bit ago. Most likely this is what you're gonna find though for your soldiers. These are the pensions that were granted in the 1870s. These are the pension index cards on fold three. I picked this one here because it has all, most everything is spelled out on here. You don't always find that on these pension index cards. The name of the soldier, his widow, the, uh, he was a private in Captain Crawford's company of the Massachusetts militia, which again, way back with the service records, you know, the captain, you could match it up to the pension that was granted later. His enlistment and discharge dates of September 10th, 1814. He only served about six weeks. So if you remember those bounty land acts, someone who only served about six weeks, those really, he's only gonna be eligible for 40 acres of bounty land at first, which shows up here, bounty land, 40 acres under the act of 1850. There's the document number. And they went back and got the rest of the Halloween candy, 120 acres under the act of 1855. And that's that document number. Over here, S-O-S-C-W-O-W-C, survivor's original survivor certificate. This is what the soldier himself would have applied for. When you first apply, you're given a number. When you are approved, you get a certificate number. That's why there's two numbers. And then you could probably guess what the W stands for. Widow's original, widow certificate. So in this case, he applied and then she applied. Down here, all this is filled out from information within the pension file. So here's some tips for navigating through these pension files. Keep in mind, like I keep saying, these were not granted until 1871 at the earliest. That's 56 years after the war ended. If you put that in modern terms, uh, World War I ended in 1945. Six years later was 2001. But there certainly were a lot of soldiers alive in 2001 that were in World War II, but there certainly were a lot that had already died. Same kind of thing. That's why you find a lot of soldiers aren't even showing up in the pension indexes because either he or the widow were still alive. In the pension files, it's pretty likely you'll find information about the fi their family, details about their service. You can find affidavits from other friends or family saying that they testify that I know that they were married when they claimed to be married. I know he was in the war, all those kind of things. I know he was of good character. If you find someone giving an affidavit about your ancestor, this is somebody that knew your ancestor pretty well. So it might be someone worth looking into as well, especially if he mentions he was also a soldier, giving testimony that I know that he was a good soldier and all that kind of stuff. Check out that other soldier's pension file to see if your ancestor returned the favor in his. Remember that blue paper that the bounty line applications were on? If you're looking through a pension file and you run across blue paper, most likely that's the bounty line information that was put into that pension file later on. Also, if you're looking through the pensions and you find documents dated from the 1850s, most likely that's also bounty line information because 
most of these soldiers weren't applying for these things until the 1870s. So there's really no reason to have documents from the 1850s and these pensions unless it's the bounty land. If you're looking at these War of 1812 pensions, uh, a lot of times you find this cover page. It's kind of like a, a jacket. You can see there's a fold down the middle. There were papers included in the middle. Uh, and a lot of times I would see these and just overlook them until I started really paying attention to what's being said here. One key piece of information was this pension was granted under the Act of 1878. That's that one that was much more lenient. So there's a good chance this widow was married after the war ended. Because in order to be eligible under the Act of 1871, you had to have been married before the war ended. And down here, 22105-120-55, does that make sense to you right now? Hopefully you have some idea of what that means. But under the Act of 1855, she got 120 acres, document number 22105. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this is also what you, what you find in a lot of these pension files, which just looks like a scrap of paper that was thrown in here. But you find these in a lot of them. But do you see anything on here that might make sense to you now? Well, I'll show you what I found. Um, the zoom controls are in the way. I think that says that under the Act of 1855, warrant number 22105. We sub 40A, which I think stands for 40 acres. This looks like a document number. I see what it looks like to be 120 acres. So I think this is referring to the bounty land that she got. And by the way, it does not stand for Revolutionary War. at received warrant 94785. So we're going to look at this pension file as we close this out. This was a pension file for a soldier by the name of Thomas Truman. Thomas had died, and his widow Elizabeth was applying for a pension on his behalf. So I got this pension, was looking through it, and this was the first page on the stack. Now remember, this was a soldier named Thomas Truman. Absalom Truman was his son, going on and on and on, Always told by my late father that I was born on Feb or June 30th, 1814. My mother always told me I was born on June 30th, 1814. It's always been treated, spoken of, and regarded as his birthday. I now understand that I was 62 years old on June 30th last. Going on and on and on and on about his exact birth date. I read that. I'm like, what is going on? Why is he going on and on about this? It reminds me of when I was in college. And you'd have to write like a 500 word essay and you were like 90 words short. So you start just stretching out ideas to be longer and longer. I mean, Absalom, you could just tell us you were born on June 30th, 1814 and wouldn't believe you. I don't know why he was going on and on. The other question is, why was it so important for Absalom to talk about his own birthday and his mother's widow's pension? So I want you to put your genealogical thinking caps on. Do you have any idea why Absalom might have been doing this in the pension file? And I will give you sort of a hint that this page was out of order. If it was put in the correct order, it might make a little more sense. One thing that I didn't tell you because it was out of order was this was being applied for under the Act of 1871. So look at the requirements they had to fulfill for this pension file. Do you see any of these requirements that he may have been trying to fulfill by going on and on and on about his birthday being June 30th, 1814? Well, there's only really one on there that could make any kind of sense. It would be this one, that he was using indirect evidence to show that his parents were at least together before 1815. It's not exact proof they were married, but he was giving the best evidence that he could to support that claim. This is an example of why it's important to know these pension acts and the requirements, because otherwise you may read that and think, what on earth is going on? Well, this explains it. So if we put this pension file back in order, 
this should have been the first page. The declaration for the widow's pension is the application. In this case, Elizabeth Ledman was saying that she was married to Thomas Truman in June of 1813. So there's that claim. She was married before 1815. She's giving her maiden name as Ledman, saying that she, they were married in Clay County, West Virginia. I'm sorry, that he married in Harrison County, Virginia. He died in Clay County, West Virginia in 1875. So the Pension Bureau wrote back and said, we need some kind of proof because we have presumptive evidence that you were not married as you alleged. We need a special inquiry to, to know for sure that you were married uh, in 1813 or prior to February 15th, 1815. So they were sticking to that rule. We need some kind of proof of what you're saying. So she wrote back and said, basically, I can't furnish a public record of that marriage. There was no record ever made for that marriage. I mean, makes sense. You can't document a marriage that was never documented, right? So then comes along Absalom Truman saying that, well, okay, I was born in June of 18, uh, 1814. That's got to count for something. So this now is in context. It makes a little more sense. She wrote to a family friend named Peter McEwen and said, can you, um, can you tell the Pension Bureau that you were at the marriage and that you know that I was married in 1813? So he wrote back and he said, okay, I will do that. He wrote to the Pension Bureau and said, yeah, I know they were married in 1813. I was there. I knew the family. But he kind of complicated the whole thing by saying, she's claiming to be Elizabeth Ledman. I don't know who that is because I knew her as Betty Stackhouse. So he really complicated things. So the Pension Bureau now needed some kind of explanation as to why are you calling yourself Elizabeth Ledman and he's calling you Betty Stackhouse. So then she had to go back and she wrote, detailed it out that when she was born, her name really was Elizabeth Ledman. Her father died, her mother got remarried when she was very young and she took her stepfather's last name, which was Stackhouse. So she really was Elizabeth Ledman, but a lot of times she was known as Elizabeth or Betty Stackhouse. So would you really think to look for documentation of Elizabeth Ledman's father and his death date and Elizabeth's husband's 4 of 1812 pension file? Probably not, but it's in there. There's documentation of these events that probably happened in the 1700s. She also took out the pages from the family Bible, sent them into the Pension Bureau, and those remained in the pension file at the National Archives. There's Absalom Truman, born June 30th, 1814. All that's in there. So they accepted that as proof that they were married before 1815. But now they're saying we need to, the loyalty of the soldier and the claimant should be investigated. Do you know what that's talking about? Because that one really confused me at first. I was trying to think, loyal to who? Were they loyal to each other? What does that mean? But that's, again, when it becomes important to know the pension acts and the, the uh, qualifications that you needed to meet. Since this census was under the Act of 1871, there's only one thing that would make reasonable sense here that anybody who aided the Confederacy was disqualified. They needed some kind of proof that she was loyal to the Union. So she wrote to somebody and said, can you document for the Pension Bureau that I really was loyal to the Union? So we get this right here, which at times sounds a lot like modern day, doesn't it? If she had disloyal sentiments, I would have known it. The community was divided. The feeling was bitter. Person of opposite opinions were known to their opponents. I generally knew all who were unfriendly to the government in this vicinity. So that was proof enough too. So she was approved for the pension because of all of that. There were more documents in there. I just showed some of the significant ones in there. Where are these pension files? By now you should know that they are all the originals at the National Archives. If you're looking for those old war ones or the half pay pensions, those are not online. Those are only going to be at the National Archives. I already mentioned this earlier, but those pension files, A through R, are on full three, R and S 
and the end of the alphabet are still being worked on. If you've got an end of the alphabet one, you can only get it at the National Archives. So this last thing before we wrap it up, I get enough questions about these that I just want to spend like two minutes on this. About enlistment, discharge papers, and prisoner of war records. Discharge papers for the soldiers are rare to find. I showed you the one in that 1812 application where the soldiers submitted it. So you can sometimes find them in those bounty line applications. But for the most part, those discharges were given to the soldiers and they kept them. So they're kind of rare to find. There are about 2,200 of them. There was an issue with some of the soldiers' back pay. And so these soldiers sent their discharge papers back to the National Archives. And so the, national, the military, I'm sorry, they sent them to the military and the National Archives now has them. And they kept them. And now the National Archives has all these, these discharge papers. So you might get lucky and find your ancestor among those ones. For prisoner of war records, a lot of those are going to be on Ancestry. Not all of them, but you might get some. That's a good place to start looking is there on Ancestry. For enlistment papers, a couple things to keep in mind that that fire in 1814 destroyed a lot of military papers. So if there were enlistment papers, most likely they were destroyed. But these only existed for the regular army anyway. Those are the ones that were in the U.S. Army. They were already in the military when the war broke out or they enlisted to get that bounty land. Because 90 to 95% of these soldiers were in the state militias, they're not going to have enlistment papers anyway. So most soldiers aren't going to have enlistment papers, and that's because they never had them to begin with. They were state militia. But they might have, if they were in the regular Army, they might show up on these enlistment ledgers. You can find these on Fold 3, I think, on Ancestry as well. If you find them on here, it's kind of some good information. It's a physical description about him, how old he was, where he enlisted. Some good details if you've got a regular Army guy. So how can you get these files from the National Archives? You can go there in person. They are now open. They've been, they were closed for a long time because of COVID. They are only open by appointment only right now. You can go to the National Archives website and order them, or you can hire a researcher to go for you. And um, I am a researcher that does this type of work. So if you are interested in getting your ancestors or of 1812 files or even Civil War papers, feel free to contact me through my website, civilwarrecords.com. You can email me there. There's a feature on my website where if you wanna know what records might even be available for your military ancestor. You can put on there, there's a tab that says, what's available for my ancestor. Go ahead and put that in there. As long as you know some basic information about them, we can do a free lookup. Um, if not, maybe we could you know, spend a little more time researching and see what we come up with. But if you know some basic information about your ancestor, chances are we can get a pretty good clue as to um, what records might be available and I can help you get them. So at this point, if you have questions, I will turn it back over to Elizabeth. There are many questions. Okay, let's yeah. see what we got. Yeah, so I already told people that, you know, we're a little short on time. If we don't get to all of your questions, you know, send us an email, send Brian an email. I've been putting both emails in the chat several times. So don't be afraid to, to email us. Okay. Are we ready? I'm ready if you're ready. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let's see, there was somebody asking uh, about the War of 1812 records on Family Search. Are these different, or how are they different from the compiled service records that are that you were discussing? I'll be honest. I I haven't spent a whole lot of time looking at Family Search's 1812 records, but I will tell you, they're they're. Probably not going to be very much different than what Full 3 has as far as yeah. original records go. Uh, if Full 3 does not have a general index card of a person, does that mean that there definitely is not a service packet? Uh, probably. Unless, unless it's a weird spelling or unless you're looking in the wrong state or unless he was regular army and not a state militia. Because the state, the regular army guys, they're not going to have service records no matter what. 
Yeah, there were a couple of questions about the state militias, like, are those going to be included in the bounty land warrants? Like, were those people entitled to? Yep, they were all those? entitled. Yep, there was no difference as far as that goes. Pensions? Yep, are pensions. They... Yep. Great. Yep. Okay. So that can get those questions out. Um, so there are a couple questions about, you know, other genealogical data you can get from some of these records. For example, have you ever seen the names of parents listed in any War of 1812 records? You know, in general, in general, these military records don't typically have parents' names on them. Yeah. Soldiers weren't required to give parents' names. You know, you may find them in the case of like a soldier who died. I showed you the one where the brother and sister applied on their behalf. That's a case where it might happen. Um, you may find like in a pension file or a bounty land application, you may find parent testifying to something that, I yeah. mean, but it's, it's, it's not all that common. But what you can get sometimes is indirect evidence, indirect evidence of a family friend or a cousin you know, in the case of Margaret Merkham, you have a maiden name, and now you can start looking at that kind of stuff. So, yeah. yeah. It's all about unpacking the layers. Yes. For sure. Okay. Um, were there records of suppliers to the war? So people getting supplies, I guess. Um, maybe. I don't really know on that one for sure either. For uh, the revolution, yes. But okay. I don't know about 1812. Yeah, I, I, that one I don't know for sure. That's a good, uh, send us an email. We can, we can yeah. look into the, it. The thing is, sometimes I get asked questions that I've never been asked before. I'm like, okay, that's a new thing to look up. Yeah. So this helps me too. So For sure. So the bounty land uh, applications, the ones that were rejected, are there any like reasons listed Not in always. the files? Not, Not always. always. You can tell if it's rejected by the um, by the uh, index entry. It'll say rejected true. Sometimes you just get the application and it's not really, I mean, sometimes you'll get it, but sometimes no, you just kind of have to put it together and realize it. Okay. Could the warrant for bounty land be sold before the patent was issued? Yes, that's, that's how it was done. Yeah. Great. Right. It's kind of like the gift card analogy. If I give you the gift card, you can then go buy something with the gift card. Same thing. If I give you the warrant, you can then go get the land and that's the patent. So there's no other way to do that except that way. So was there actually choice in what land they got? Yeah, you had certain federal land states to choose from. It wasn't just like, okay, you got randomly drawn for Iowa. Like now you could, as long as there was land available where you wanted to yeah. go. Great. Um, so there are a couple of people who asked about like middlemen for the, the bounty land warrants. Um, you know, so for example, someone was wondering how a widow would find a buyer. That's a good question. And I, I, I want to find that out. Um, and I've thought about that before. Were these just land speculators that were out there that were trying to buy up warrants? Yeah. I have a feeling that some of what went on is they knew that there's all this unsettled land out there and I could get it fairly cheap from these widows. If I get it, I can then resell it for a profit later on down the road. Yeah. I'm feeling that's kind of how it happened. I think there were probably ads in the newspaper yeah. of people saying, I, I will buy your bounty land. Yeah. That sounds logical to me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm already answering some of these. Uh, okay. Do widows get land under the Act of 1855? Yes. Yeah. So, this is a very, this is a little specific. What amount bounty land would a veteran of Black Hawk War be entitled to? Um, you know what? Pretty much the same thing. Yeah. The bounty land acts were for anything that happened from 1855 or earlier. Not the revolution. Although some revolutionary soldiers were still alive and got it. So if there was an Indian War, the um, Mexican War happened in the 1840s, so they qualified. Same thing, they could get 160 acres of bounty land or less, depending on how long they served. Okay. Um, 
see. So I, there are a lot of questions about the bounty line. Records. Yeah, I kind of scrolled through them yeah. here too. Yeah. Uh, did all soldiers wait until 1850 to redeem their land grants? Um, well, here's the way that worked. 1850 was the first point they could even apply for the land. So to wait till 1850 means almost implies that they had it in the 1840s, which wouldn't have been possible because the law wasn't passed till the 1850s. Yeah. One thing that maybe I want to clarify that could be a little confusing, it was the act of 1850. That does not mean the land was granted in 1850. It was a law that was passed in 1850 that made it possible. So you will find people applying for bounty land under the act of 1850, but they're doing it in 1854, you know, so yeah. don't let that throw you off. They're just using that year as when the law was passed. So I'm going to ask one more question about land and then we'll do a pension question. Okay. And then we'll, we'll finish for the evening. Um, so the last question about land was about Native Americans who would be receiving land and then the trail of tears start. Is there any records that exist for those individuals? There might, but that's, that's not anything I'm an expert on, so I don't yeah. know the answer to that. Yeah, that's, a, that's an email question. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because I, I'm not an expert in that either. Yeah, that's, that's not really military so much, so I, I, don't, I don't know that one for sure. Yeah, okay, and let's see. Uh, I saw a pension question. Oh, did the pension acts of 1812 era only apply to the army or also, uh, I already asked that question, or also the militia? So you said yes. Say that question again. The pension acts of 1812, um, did that, of the 1812 era, did that only apply to the army or did that also apply to the militia? The 1812 era, for the most part, only applied to, um, no, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm thinking bounty land. For the pensions. Yes. Yeah, yes. If you pensions, were, yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Can I answer one question that showed up here real quick? Sure. I can, yeah. I can find the patent, but not the warrant. Just asking, what am I missing? So you're obviously missing the warrant, but you know that. One thing you can do is that maybe it's being indexed under a weird spelling. So what you can do is on that Bureau of Land Management site, take the patent number. Like maybe it's, you know, 94875, go back and search for that specific document number. And maybe you can do a reverse search because there is a way to search just for that document number, narrow it down to the script warrant acts, those kind of things. And you can maybe see um, that it's indexed under a totally different spelling that you wouldn't have thought of. I do that kind of thing all the time when people are looking for these. Great. All right. So we are just about out of time, everyone. Thank you, Brian, for such a wonderful presentation. And thanks, everybody, Thank for, for joining us this evening. Now, well, thanks uh, for having me. Great. Now, if any of you would like a copy of the chat, you know, send us an email. I put our email in the chat, but it's genealogy at acpl.info. All right. Well, have a good evening, everybody. Bye. All right. Thanks, everybody.